Welcome to the first turn. I'm Hyena, and today, Llama and I talk about the new Age of Sigmar battle tones for Gloom Spike Gets and Beasts of Chaos. We talk about the Arcs of Omen campaign for Warhammer 40k, and what we expect to come out of the later chapters. We also talk about game design and terminology, and how important it is for games' rule sets to be clean, and more. Enjoy! Alright, so, what are we talking about today? Blink, blink, blink. We are talking about uh, two new battle tomes coming out for Age yep. of Sigmar. Uh, I think they're this weekend. Uh, we haven't seen them at the store, which if they were, we should have gotten them by now. But no uh, we've got Beast of Chaos, we've got Gloom Spike Gets, and man, let me tell you, I am impressed by these books so far. Because we have, I, I, I haven't dug deep into reviews of the books to see mm -hmm. what their Legion stuff does. I assume it's very similar to what they previously have, but I've come through the War Trolls and there are a lot of stat improvements across the armies to the point where it's yeah. like, I really like these armies now. Um, a couple of standout units, I think, are in the Getz army, which I really, really like, would be um, River Trolls, yep. some, of my, some of my favorite units, and uh, Scragrot the Loon King. He feels to me like you're like similar to other faction leaders, right? Like Those the Fellwater ones you were talking about? Yeah, the Fellwater oh, gotcha, Trolls. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, 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 the River Trolls. <laughs> they don't have the new Wolf Riders in there yet. Yeah, they are in there. They're done in other. Uh, they're called... Mm, uh, oh, Snarl Fang Snarl Fangs. We got there. there. Yeah. Snarl Fangs. Uh, but yeah, but Sragrot's kind of insane. He's a he's a six wound character, five up save, four up ward, I believe, which is befitting a like faction leader. Yeah. They should have. He has wizard fighty stats. Yeah. But his fighty stats are actually pretty good. It's three swings on threes and threes. Like that's that's not bad for a wizard. The juice comes from the fact that he casts multiple spells. He knows all the spells from the book. He has, uh, I think, one plus one to casting on binding. Yep. So he's a reliable caster. And his the spell he knows is bonkers. Casting value of three. So easy. So easy. Whatever he casts on, you roll that many dice. On a three up, it's a mortal wound to the target. So, you know, you, you roll a casual eight, you know, casting value. You succeed on a two, by the way, because you have plus one. Or, uh, yeah. You succeed on anything but double ones. Yep. It, so it'll always be, go, be going off. You, you roll a seven or eight, you know, you roll that many dice, it's five, six mortal wounds yeah. to a target within 24. That's an insane spell. It's so good. Um, and the bigger thing is he he just counts as the moon. All the buffs that the army gets for being in the light of the moon, he is a beacon of moonlight. Super good. Uh, and then he gets basically a free command point every turn to, to cast, you know, something from yeah, himself. he gets to choose if the moon stays or moves. Yeah. Ugh. He's so good, and he's only 160 points. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's nutty he's so good so i think he was a standout i really like him uh and then the fellwater trogoths have a really short range well they have a four up save now which is great they guarantee regenerate which is great uh they have a ranged attack it's only six inches but it hits very reliably twos threes minus two d3 damage one shot per guy but the cool thing is they are uh because they're stinky they're minus one to hit them and if you hit, uh, now, if you deal any wound to the target with that vomit, two things happen. <laughs> and this is funny. There needs to be more of this in the game. <laughs> when they're drenched in vomit, you subtract one from their save rolls for attacks that target them. Yep. So, like, you, when you fight them next, they're minus one to their saves, essentially. Blech. And you ignore any positive modifiers that they might have. So they, spells. So they had yeah. spells that give them or all defense that gives them a plus one to their defense or to their saves. Lord. They ignore that and then you reduce by one. That's huge because there are so many, even though you can only get that plus one technically, people still find ways to stack it so right. that they ignore the first four points of rend or whatever. Right. Well, this is like, no, no you're back at your save yeah. and worse. So uh, if you had, and they don't even, it doesn't just, just apply to them. It's, it's the target. Yeah. So if you have something that has a minus two rend or something. All of a sudden, with that, it's a minus three. Mm -hmm. And ignore positive modifiers. So something with a two-up save now is only seven on five. Oof, that's rough. That hurts. So I really like those guys. Uh, they're a bit pricey, but they have defenses now. Like, I don't know. I think they're great. I love them. I think those trolls are great. And I was reading, which one was Grin Crack? Uh, he is the new one that comes out with the Warband. He's got the two Squigapult. Launchers. Underworlds. Yeah, the War Underworld Band. Warband. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah. that's why he costs that much. Yeah, because he comes with a unit of like five guys. Gotcha. Yeah. But he's super good. Five swings yep. is great. That's... Well, and he gives, uh, lets nearby stuff fight when they die. Yep. 
Um, uh, speaking of fighting when you die, they improved squig units by a lot. Not only the, just the random movement becomes flat plus a random amount, but the, the squig herds, for example, was, it might be my, my other favorite unit in the book. Okay. So you've got squigs, and then they've got handlers. Anytime a squig uh, flees from, uh, from battle shock, uh, before what it was, it was, something, it was something bad. Like, choose a unit within one inch of the model fleeing... So it wasn't even like the unit of the model fleeing on a four up that unit takes a mortal wound. That's like, all right, I lost a two a two wound model, right? But half the time I deal a mortal wound back. It's awful. Yeah. Now what it is is anytime a, a model flees, choosing it within nine inches on a two up it takes a mortal wound. Nine. It's a nine inch range shooting attack. Yep. On a two it takes a mortal wound, and it doesn't have to be the thing that shot you. Like anything. And then for each handler you have in one of the phases, roll a dice on a two up, D three squigs come back per guy, and you have two of them in a unit by default. <laughs> on a on a one, one of them dies. But if you reinforce that unit up to that, you've got four handlers, and so you're restoring four D three squigs Whoops. per turn. Yep, I believe that's how that works. Let me just double check it, so I'm not like talking out my ass here. I did read it earlier. This unit cannot receive commands. <laughs> That's kind of funny. However, at the start of each of your hero phases, you roll one dice for each squig herder in this unit. For each two, you restore D3 slain cave squigs to so this unit. So four herders would be two D3. So it's for each two, right? Mm, for each two plus on the dice. You have to roll. Oh, so it not, fails not on each one. two yeah, no, herders. Not herders. So you can have four herders rolling four dice. Every two up you roll is D3 guys back. So four D3. And that's, in you know, uh, I guess you can't rally them. Okay, so there, there's a trade-off. So if, like, your your squig handlers die, you can't do a rally to bring back squig handlers. <laughs> but still, as long as you're, like, shifting out mortal wounds from your, your squigs fleeing, which they'll do reliably, their bravery is three, one squig dies, you're looking at one squig runs on a three-up. Nice. <laughs> like, that's pretty That's pretty reliable fleeage. This, this other Underworlds unit... Molog. Molog, yep. Is only a buck thirty. Yeah. For an eight wound guy. And technically he's more than that because he's got all the little like stalactite squigs yep. with him that count as extra wounds. But those guys all do stuff. Wounds. Yeah, they're all, he, he's he's all right. They eat wounds for him. Yeah. One is a shooting attack that does mortals. Yep. They heal. Um one can make it so enemies are at minus one to hit. Yep. I like him. Molog's fine. And then one can just soak up a wound, but on a five it's negated. Yeah. Stalag squig. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing I don't like. Uh, one of the other standouts is the is the Skitter Strand. That's the new hero. Squig Boss. The Squig Boss. Gotcha. Yeah. He's only 80? Yeah. Most of the handler, like, little heroes are, are pretty cheap. Um, the other standout, I think, is the Arachnorok Spider. No, the, 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 the Skitter Strand Arachnorok Spider, which is the, the one it. without a crew. Yep. 14 wounds now on a 4-up save. Okay. Cool. The, the interesting thing about him is this. So all spiders have their monster's venom. Which is if they roll six to hit, it's three mortal wounds from their bite. Already great. Uh, they still have their wall crawler where they can fly, technically fly, when they're moving over terrain. Fine. But his ability, ambush from beyond. I'll read it to you. During deployment, instead of setting up, you can be set up in ambush, whatever. You can come in at, at the end of your movement phase outside of nine. Pretty standard. But here's the, here's the catch. In addition, at the end of the combat phase... You can say that this unit will ambush again. If you do so, remove it from the battlefield. It is set up in ambush as a reserve unit once more. So it comes in in the movement phase, charges, fights, ambushes, and disappears. It's off the table for your opponent's turn, comes back on yours, charges, fights, ambushes again. Mm -hmm. Like, it can pop up all over the board just ambushing things. He's got to hit that charge. Sure, but... Yep. Even if you don't hit the charge, it doesn't say you need to be in combat to go and vanish again. If you nope. fail the charge, you just vanish again. You know what I mean? For 200 points, that you is a, even, that, that yeah, is a scary threat. Like, well, I failed the charge. Yeah. I'm going to ambush. Yeah. Get out of here. Super cool. I I I think it's great. Spider Venom does lots of mortal wounds. Yep. Um, he's got a pile of attacks that all hit pretty well. Yeah. I like him. Yeah. I think it's a fun. 200 points. Pretty cheap. Well, yeah. It's super, super cool. So, big fan of that army. Uh, Beasts made out very similarly. Uh, I really like now, I think my favorite units might be... Oh my goodness, that uh, Uh, dank old 
guy yeah. hits like a truck. Yeah, he does. He's pretty good. <laughs> and he, he heals D6 per turn. And there's no uh, there's no track on him. I don't know, I don't remember if he had a track before. Well, yeah, um, he's just a 10 wound. Yeah, he's pretty good. Monster. Uh, the Chaos, Beasts of Chaos book is, is a little more interesting. Um, mostly because so many of their units got improved. More than that, even. Like, the Gits all kind of felt like they did. And I have to imagine they fixed the Herdstone, right? They did and they didn't. Great. So it still does what it does, but it just does it slower. So the biggest change to the Herdstone is they delayed everything by a turn. Hmm. That's the big thing. So on turn one, you do not get any rend bonus. Good. On turns two and three, you get minus one extra. On turns four and five, you get minus two extra. Which is which is good because that feels like, well, turns one through, through three, which are the most impactful turns, you get a small benefit. But it's still benefit. Turns four and five, when you need to close the game out, you get your biggest benefit, but you'll have less stuff alive to take advantage of it, right? So it's it's a good trade-off without just getting rid of that mechanic altogether. So I like it. I think that's that slows it down just enough that it doesn't feel broken anymore. Uh, I like... So the new Beast Lord model, yeah. uh, which looks great. Yep. Now, I don't know if he always had this ability, but that Hatred of Heroes... So... If he's within three of an enemy hero... Yeah. He has a bubble of plus one hit and wound for everyone within 12. Yeah. And it doesn't say they have to target that hero. Right. Exactly. As long as he's near a hero, they're all... (laughs) Yep. He had something similar. I don't think it was exactly that. But, I mean, it's it's a fine ability. And you just get it all the time. Uh, What you'll notice is a, a lot of the times now with this army, they'll have a special rule that says if you receive an order, you get an extra benefit. Mm. It's something weird like that. Or there's they're doing more uh, more things around giving out orders now. Uh, Gets had some where, um, like if you receive an order, you get an extra benefit. Uh, one of the Gets units was if you receive the all out attack command that order instead of just getting plus one to hit, you also get plus one attack and plus one to hit. So they're they're kind of doing some of that instead of giving out a, a hero a unique order to give out, they're giving a unit has an extra benefit when they receive that order. So it's like, that's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. Um, which ties into that is the Bestigors. When a Bestigor unit is attacking a unit that receives, yeah, uh, is attacking a unit that receives the aunt defense command, they get plus one attack against that unit. Nice. So it's like either you eat my normal attacks or you can aunt defense to get, to get uh, extra saves but I get more attacks against you. Mm-hmm. So it's super cool. That's 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 a despoiler ability. Before it was like plus one to hit versus units that have banners. It was something like that. It was awful. <laughs> uh, the bigger thing with Bestigors now is that they are 22 points a piece. Yeah. Up from like 13 or 14. But they also have two wounds now. Bestigors are actually elite infantry. Yeah. They're now two wound models. Good. Which is like, good. Yeah. You, you, you actually differentiate them from Gores. Instead of just being yeah. more expensive with one better save. Right. Um, uh, and then their big thing is their standard bearer lets them uh, rally on a five instead of a six. So super cool. I I, I like them a lot. Uh, and then if if the enemy uses the unleash hell command on them, not only is the enemy minus one to hit, they're also minus one to wound them. So they are like more reliable. Nice. Um, at getting into, uh, into combat, even if they're like overwatched. So... I like those. Is it me or is their Zangor champion really cheap? He's 115. The the, the Zangor shaman? Well, he's shit now. So I'm not surprised they're cheap. I mean, six wounds, move 16, fly. Yeah. But like he lost all the synergy with the the Zangors for the most part. Like all of it's gone. And he loses a lot of the benefits that he would have gotten from being in the Zinch army. So because he's a beast of chaos Zangor shaman. Yep. He doesn't have the same war scroll. So they can like change the points of him without yeah. affecting the slate, well, I mean, he, the, uh, he, the other he, book. He mortal wound bolts a yeah. unit and then puts Zangor models back in a Zangor unit. Um, which which he's always had that, which is fine. That's Buna mutation. One fifteen for a guy that can move like that, though. Yeah, he's fine. But did they? So it used to be that the Zangors were better in Beast than they were in Disciples of Zinch. Is right. that still the case? Um, you think? I w- I want to say still, yeah. <laughs> But they might have a different cost in beasts now. Yeah, one seventy. I, I, I haven't checked that. They might cost different because they are have different allegiance abilities. What's their but, base unit size? But, but you know, ten it should be. But they should. Um, they also have a different name now. They are specifically beasts of chaos, Zangor, yep, mob, or whatever they call. Them. Other people are 
Yeah. So you can't cross them over. Cross them over. Yeah. Uh, Dragon Ogres are really good now, too. Oh, good. <laughs> Which... A unit that they made plastic late in Fantasy's yeah. life and were never used. So, before they had something like five or six attacks, no rend one. <laughs> now they're just straight up five attacks at minus one, two. Like, they got the uh, they got the Varengard treatment. Where they're like, eh, just double their damage. They're just fine. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, if they made a charge in the same turn, they auto wound on sixes to hit. Not mortal wounds, but they just skip the wound roll, mm-hmm. which is really good. Uh, they do mortal wounds to enemies nearby them at the end of the combat phase, which is good. They heal. They heal at the end of the combat phase. Like So making all of that more reliable made that a better unit, and they're fightier now. So I, I really like those. Bulgors, their, their blood greed now is whatever they're, they're wielding. If you're all six to hit, it's just that many mortal wounds of that weapon. Plus they have, um, what is it? They still have, yeah, they also have charge mortal wounds. So every model rolls a dice on a two up. They deal one mortal wound to the target. So like lots of mortal wounds put into the, to the Minotaur unit. How would you compare them to Theridans? Um, hmm. I, if they costed the same, how much are Theridans? I forget. Theridans 170 for three. I think they are. These are 195 for These three. are 190. These are expensive. I, I think they might be a little bit too expensive. So do you have them open right now? Uh, the Bulgars. I have mean? the Bulgars. Yeah, one ninety five. I'll open the Theridans here. And we'll... But they're move seven. They get plus one to charge. We'll do. Um, a, we'll do up apples to apples here. Yeah. Uh, there they are. So one ninety for the Theridans. Okay. One ninety five for the Minotaurs. So close. Okay, pretty damn close. Move six. Seven. Five wounds. Four. Five up. Five up. Bravery six. Six. Yeah. Okay. Pretty similar. So they traded one move for one wound. Yep. Oh, that's a bad trade. I but like, I like one wound better. <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, keep going. Uh, so weapons are different, right? Yeah. So either have the falchions that are three swings at threes, threes, minus one, two. Okay. Or the great axe that's three swings at threes, threes, minus two, three. Yeah, so that's interesting. So these guys have a one-handed weapon that's fours, threes, minus one, two, two swings. But they have a shield then. Mm-hmm. Or they can go double weapons, not have the shield, have four swings at fours, threes, minus one, two. Or go the great axe, which is two swings. Three, three, minus one, three. So they're great so, axes. So I think the great axe is way worse for min- for minotaurs. Correct. But, or the bulgars, but they also have a chance to do mortal wounds when sixes to hit, whereas the theridans don't. Right. And then the bulgars also get two gore attacks with their horns at four, four, no ren, two, which can also do mortal wounds if you roll six to hit. Right. So it's like, it's pretty close. Yep. The damage outputs are pretty close. And then also... They do mortal wounds when they charge. If they have a a, a, a musician, yeah, these do. These get plus one to wound if they took damage. Yeah, which eh. yep. The drummer gives plus one to charge. The Same. standard bearer gets re-roll the dice to determine whether the unit suffers one mortal wound this when just, they charge. Yeah, so <laughs> this musician does the same. Yeah, plus one to charge, but this standard bearer is one to bravery. Yeah, that's way worse. Yep. Uh, uh, like you might not even include that that bearer. So these guys have more regular attacks that hit better. Yeah. But, but also, they don't have the mortal wound output. But also keep in mind they can take a mark. They can take So they're almost like straight across. <laughs> they are. They are pretty, very, pretty very similar. similar. Yeah. So I'm 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 fine with it. Yeah. That's cool. Uh another unit that got so much better is the Centigors. Believe it or not. We need plastic. The Centigors. <laughs> so they are a unit of five for 170. So that's a lot. Okay, that's a lot. But it's a 14-inch move with a 4-up save. Look at those sweet old models. Yeah. Two swings. They have a spear ranged attack. They throw a spear mm-hmm. for 1-1 one, one, or minus 1-1. One, one. Fine. They, they hit some threes instead of fours. Yeah. They, hit, they have two attacks in melee, 3-3 three, three minus 1-1. One, one. Uh, they also have claw attacks, which mm-hmm. is fine. They are plus 1 attack to all the units melee weapons. So, three, so 6 total attacks instead of 4. While they're within nine inches of an objective that you don't control. So if they're trying to steal an objective, they get bonus attacks. And the first two points of damage, they just don't take. They reduce damage taken every com- uh, in the combat phase, I guess. In the combat phase, they reduce the, the damage they take by two. Every combat phase. The first two wounds yeah. or mortal wounds caused to this unit in the combat phase are negated. Yeah, so mm. automatically. And if you fail a battle shock, roll a, roll a dice on a two-up, they don't flee. Because they're drunk. So they just don't break. I mean, their bravery is not awful. It's a six with a plus one. 
they can retreat and charge later in the turn. Yeah, which is great. I don't know. I, I think they're that is very good. They're pretty the good. The whole unit. I mean, uh, one seventy is expensive, but they're pretty good. Oh, if they would just make plastic ones. I know. Uh, so it was those. Um, the Slangor Fiend Bloods are in the book. Oh yeah, and they're actually not bad. Uh, they're a little pricey. Three of them, three wounds, one thirty. Five up a save. They're quick. Eight eight move. But they have four swings each. Fours, threes, minus one, two. They move eight. The leader has five swings at fours, threes, minus one, two. Uh, they they move if they are if they're hurt and nothing's within within nine of them. They get to move Three whenever move they take D6, damage, yep. which is cool. Uh, they can once per battle fight twice. Okay, <laughs> it's like I actually really I, like I, that. It's like I don't mind them, but I don't think they had these weapon profiles in the actual uh, Slanesh book. They were not this good. Oh, Heed Knights? Yeah. Probably not. Like, it was something awful. Like, they had four attacks I, at, at one, but then the leader had, like, six attacks at two. It I was just, something weird I like that. I just when Heed Knights got round two of their models. Yeah. They had the armored infantry and these guys. Yeah. And their stats all sucked for the so, points. And they're still kind of bad. Yeah. But we'll They haven't we'll got say. their third ed book yet. Yeah. Uh, and the other one I really liked, really, really liked, was the Gorgon, believe it or not. The melee monster? No. No, I'm sorry. Sigor, that's the one. Sigor, he's a monster. Two ten, sixteen wounds. I think that's up to. I think he was only fourteen yeah. before. Yep. Uh, five save, whatever. He's got the one boulder shot at three two minus two full health, five, five flat damage. <laughs> he's got. He's now fighty as shit. He's got seven goring attacks at three two minus one two. That's mm-hmm. good for a for a shooter. For anti- a wizard. And then he's he's not or a wizard. Anti-wizard. He's not a, he's yeah. anti wizard. But in the one um. Some faction, he could be a priest, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, now he's got an aura that's not, oh, you can unbind like a wizard, and if you unbind a spell, that wizard takes D3 mortal wounds. Now it is literally 30-inch range aura. Any successful cast by an enemy wizard within 30, they automatically take a mortal wound. Yeah. Every single time they cast a spell, take a mortal wound. And you can attempt to unbind two. If you want. Uh, and then the other one is you can do a monstrous rampage, consume endless spell. If you if you perform this, you and you unbind a spell immediately. If you beat it, however many, how, whatever you roll in the two d six, you heal that many wounds yep. when you unbind so he the spell. So goes and eats endless spells. So it's like, oh, casting value seven. I'll roll, you know, I'll roll a seven to unbind it. It's successful. He eats it and heals seven. Yeah, that is wild. He does only have a five up. Yeah, that's true. Begin. But sixteen wounds is great, and he's got the healing mechanic against spells. Yeah, I like it. So yeah, I um, that's I, hilarious. I'm pretty happy with with all of the raw stats we've seen from both books, just yep. because it's like, and it's even the, pretty good, and even the melee monster, the Gorgon, he's fine. He, so he's more expensive. He's two forty. He yeah. is up to sixteen wounds. Yeah, but he gets seven swings. Oh, he hits on fours. Fours. Keep reading though. Twos minus one flat three. Yeah, and then he bites two times for four two minus one d six. Moves eight. Uh, after he makes a pile and move, you can pick a number of enemy models within three of this unit equal to or less than the swallow hole value, which starts at three. Yep. Roll a dice for each. If the roll is greater than that model's wounds characteristic, it is slain. Okay, so he kills it. And then you heal for each guy you eat. Yeah, he just so swallows So it's like, okay, you, you, you kill three models, you heal three wounds. He has his own monster's rampage. Yep. It says, improve the red characteristic of this unit's melee weapons by one until the end of the following combat phase. In addition, until the end of the following combat phase, if... Any enemy models are slain by it. Oh, he heals more. He heals more. So he super heals. Yeah. So you you just have to keep him in combat. Yeah. And just keep eating. Yeah. And then I'm sure they'll get something in terms of like extra damage or extra yep. something from the book. There's got to be yeah, special right? rules in the book. So I think some of the stuff got taken off of their war scrolls to be an allegiance ability. So if you bring them as an ally, mm, they don't get it. That could be. So yeah. So lots of healing. Uh, pretty good damage. What would we say? Seven swings at three and... Two swings at D6. I mean, bad rend, but it doesn't matter because you're getting an additional minus one rend in melee from your herd stone anyway, starting on turn two. Great Ray Shaman's 95. So. He did lose some of his utility. He lost his ability to like just give just give out movement speed, which is why you took him before. Now it's that infused with bestial vigor is now um, six inch range on heroic actions. So whatever whatever their rituals of, of ruin. Which we don't know uh, yet. Which we don't know yet because it's in the book. Whatever it is, he gets plus six inches to the range of the ritual. Cool. So, I mean, there could be something. He's got Devolve, which is a classic from fantasy. Yep. Um, 
Which is brutal. Pick an enemy unit within range, which is 18, invisible, until your yeah. next hero phase roll 3d6 before that unit makes a normal move, runs, retreats, or makes a charge. If the roll is greater than that unit's bravery, the maximum distance is halved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's just, the maximum distance. Just screwing them up. But that's interesting, though. That's interesting how it's worded. It's not saying the distance is halved, right? Your charge isn't reduced from 2d6 to 6. The maximum distance is, re- is reduced. So if you're charging and you roll 2d6 and you get above a 6, whatever you rolled, the maximum you can go is 6 inches. So if you roll a 9, it gets reduced to 6. So, like, as long as you're 6 inches out, you're you're pretty much always making that 6-inch charge anyway. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The maximum distance that of that move is half. Well, maximum. Well, so the maximum distance right? of that move would be whatever you rolled, you get to move up to that, right? So if you roll a 8 on a 2d6, yeah. your max is 8. See, I don't know if uh, if I read it like that though, because the maximum distance on a charge is twelve. You know what I mean? You, yeah, the max you can roll. Right, but it doesn't say reduce. You know, reduce your roll by half. It says the maximum by half. So for a movement, yeah, I agree. You, your max move is eight because your movement characteristic is eight. It's reduced by half down to four. Yeah. Well, I think I think. But the, for a random one, I don't know. But well, I think it might be the same because for a charge, mm-hmm. you don't have to move. Yeah. The distance you roll. Yeah. FAQ him. Yeah, and he's FAQ because that, that's not clear enough. And there could be somebody who, because, who dinks with it. Because of maximum, mm-hmm. that word. If it just said, if, the, if it's greater than braver characteristic, the distance that is moved is halved. How much easier would it have been to just do that? Right. The distance moved is halved. Mm-hmm. Okay, I get it. I have, whatever I roll, half of it. But the maximum distance. You know, and it's it's funny. I don't know. For all, for all the good GW is doing, and I think they're doing more good than bad. They have a problem wording rules still, yeah, yeah. where, where they, they sometimes put too many words in, mm-hmm. sometimes don't put enough words in. Yeah. And, and so it ends up like this, inconsistent, vague. And we were just going through some of the new cards for the Magic set yeah. coming up tomorrow. Wizards of the Coast, for all the bad they do, mm-hmm. which they do more bad than good, their rules are almost always, in mechanics, are almost always airtight yeah. because they use the same words. Well, you say that. They use the same <laughs> words wherever they, do. they can. They do. The one chance there is for them to be... But man, the stack is just a confusing monster to me. Sure. Cause, and there are times when like... Because there's a gigantic forum for magic of, of like course. how things interact. Because, you know, it's been going for 30 years now. Well, and you know? the reason why there can be interactions issues there is because you have cards that are 28 years old interacting right. with cards made yesterday. Right. So uh, the simplest way to remember the stack before they called it the stack was they used to call it last in, first out. Okay. The last thing that happens on the stack or is triggered goes first. That's okay. the first thing to resolve. Okay. And then you go in order. Okay. Like, yeah. If you have priority. Yeah. But there are certain weird things that happen, like when a thing enters the battlefield, does this, mm-hmm. but it's like, well, when does it become, like, turn into uh, a permanent, but then, like, act as a sorcery. Like, there are there are weird things that happen when it's like, well, when does it trigger? When do you, are you considered a permanent? Like... When a spell that's a sorcery summons a creature, when does it become the creature, and when is it is it still the sword? You know, yeah. it's the, spe- it's, it's the kind spell of, has to resolve that for kind the of creature weird to hit the battlefield. Yeah. If a creature touches the battlefield, it is a permanent. Yeah, yeah. but there are times. I, I there was one recently. I can't remember what the example was, but the thing is always treated as a creature even before it hits the battlefield. Yep. In terms of how this reacts as a, like a sorcery ability, it was super weird because it's like, is a sorcery becomes a permanent kind of thing. And it's like, well, when is it a permanent? And the answer is always. Yep. And so it's like, why does it say becomes then? Like, it, I don't know. There's some, and that was a new card. That was a newer card. Yeah, and the word and the word becomes there is the key. Yeah. Because they'll always use the word like that. Yeah. Like a replacement effect. Yeah. Right. So anyway, it's anyway, but but you're right. It, it is there. They are no, if nothing consistent in their wording of their rules. Their wording, their zones, and yeah. their and their stuff like yeah. that. And and I feel like Games Workshop could could make. I actually don't even think their games are that complicated. Yeah. And and there are just times in particularly in 40K and Age of Sigmar well, where they have started, mm-hmm. right? So they started to define certain game terms. Things like ward save. Yep. Is now like this is a thing in the core rules. Yep. Whenever this is an effect, we call it a ward, you know? Yep. And so once they become completely uh, um, consistent with it, yep. then you can have other effects that are not wards. Extra levels of defense or whatever, right. a different thing like the bodyguard rule or whatever that doesn't count as a ward, but is used instead of a ward. And then it's like, okay, now now it's making sense. This isn't a ward save. And you know, it's it's funny as it it eliminates 
when things stack that weren't supposed to. Right. But then it gives them a way to write exceptions that can. Right. Um, For example, that trog we were just talking about, his stalactite minion, it says, this is not a ward save. Yeah. Yep. This five up that he gets to shrug off a wound is not a ward. Right. So it's like, okay. So things that ignore wards. Don't touch it. Don't yep. touch this. Yep. He still gets this. Cool. And that's in more of that. You know, I, yep. I, I, li- I like that they're doing that. I, I think most of the time it's the first paragraph rule mm-hmm. in, in GW rules writing that bothers me. Because mm-hmm. that first paragraph is always a fluff bit. Yeah. That's like, you can say you're doing this. Right. It's like, you could skip that whole so thing. Skip all <laughs> and just tell me what the rule is. Yeah. Yeah. Less flowery language. Just, just mm-hmm. spit out the rule. And there are some that are worse than that. Yeah. You're reading paragraphs before you get to the... Yeah. Well, it, I noticed a lot of them like the, like the epic creatures. They have a lot of those things. Yeah. This does this and this and this. And you can say it does it. It's like, no. Just list it. Five up board. Four up versus spells. Yeah. You know, what, like, <laughs> just give me the things out in a list. Just what does it do? It gets rid of the gray area. They even do that when they're doing... Um, when you get to that section of a codex or battle tome where it's also like, all right, here's where we're starting the army rule. Mm-hmm. Well, the first page is like half fluff, and then the two army abilities are hidden in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then you have to find them. <laughs> it's like, skip all that. Usually they do use a different font. So like <laughs> italics is the fluff, and then it's just like normal yep. font is the, is the actual <laughs> rule. But you're right. Just like get a sticky note and cover that up. Yeah. It's out. It's out because it's not defining anything about the you rule. You have that fluff section for the first 30 pages. Yeah. Leave it all there. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So happy about those books. Uh, yeah, there's a new magic good. set we were talking about it coming out tomorrow. That's been a lot of fun to deal with. Yeah, so it's super cool. It's super fun. Even though it's not something we, we touch on on here, uh, it it can divide the attention of gamers. Absolutely. I think most people who've touched one of these games ends up at some point playing magic or D&D or, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, you did get a fun inquiry about Warhammer 40k tonight while you were working, which was, oh my God, do you have so, this book? They're so funny. Yes. Do you hey, do you have hold- this book? Do you want me to hold it? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I think it was me asking, it's like, okay, I'll hold it for you. What's your name? Nah, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, like, I should have literally asked, why'd you call that? <laughs> yeah. So what is this? What is this? It's a survey? survey. <laughs> yeah. Why did you call? Nah, whatever. It's fine. Do you um, think, do you think you'll be picking up either of these two books? Um, I'm, I don't know. I kind of want to just to see. Just to have the complete rules. You know, uh, be- I, I have missed a few. Beast, be- be- beasts are one that, like, the more plastic they get, mm-hmm. model range, the more interested in them I get. Like, the gores still hold up. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they don't really need a facelift. Best gores look good. And then now this, like, Beast Lord, the Bray Shaman's been plastic. Mm-hmm. Bull gores still look old. Santa gores, woof. Yeah, I would I would kit bash either of those two units. Yeah. I do have three Minotaurs. I mean, I would just use oh, the Theranids and make Bull I, I actually have... A beast of chaos army. Now that I think about it, <laughs> she knew. I forgot. I do. I've got I've got a gorgon and a and a cygor. Uh, I don't have any heroes. No, I've got a bray shaman. I probably have like twenty best is, of is the gargant any different in theirs? No, it's eh, he's about the same. Okay, he's got the kick. He's got the headbutt. He's got the club. He falls over when he dies. Same. Whatever. Uh, actually, both armies get a get a get a giant. They both use the same giant kit. Because one's the ale guzzler and one's the chaos. Mm-hmm. I think the the ale guzzler is cheaper because he's more clumsy and falls over if you roll like a. I don't know if he still does the doubles thing where he falls over, but he's like drunk, and so he's not as good as the chaos <laughs> one. The chaos one's more fighty, but I think the the ale guzzler is cheaper. And the and the slaves something like that. also use uh, one, don't they? No, they lost theirs. They don't have a, him anymore. They could probably ally one in. They can ally one better if okay. you wanted. They, they, yeah. Not that they need it anymore, right. but yeah, the chaos one is just is just straight up better though. And so that was, here we go, Chaos Gargant. I'm surprised they didn't call him Beast of Chaos Gargant. So he's 12 wounds, 8 move. He kicks once. Yeah. His club is 5 swings, 3s, threes, 3s, threes, no rend, 2. Yeah. And his Ed Butt is 1 hit, 4s, 3s, minus 2, flat 4. If he's slain before removing the model from the battlefield, the players must roll off. Yeah. The winner then picks a point on the battlefield 3 inches from the slain model. Each unit within 2 suffers D3 more. Okay. And he still falls when he so dies. He still falls. And there's a chance it's random. Yeah. He has the stuff him in a bag thing. Yeah. Still. But uh, he doesn't have the drunken, like, swagger when okay, he charges. if he's right? near a Beast of Chaos hero, he gets plus one to attack. With all of his attacks? With all his melee That's weapons. That's pretty good. Um, enemy units within three, I'll have minus one to save rolls. Ooh, what? Yeah. It's his aura of foulness. That's really good. So plus one attack for a hero near, a friendly hero being nearby, and then minus one. So he essentially... Has him and all of his allies 
much more effective. Minus one. By additional way, minus one rent. He is only a buck forty five. Yeah. So he, I told you he's good. Yeah. I like that one. That's not bad. That aura. I forgot about the aura. That is solid. So all of his weapons, consider them an additional minus one. Because yeah. it was zero and two and one or something like mm-hmm. that. So that's that's what the trade off is, yeah. yeah. Um and there's what you can stack all sorts of stuff here. Like the Chimera can get Chimera's great. He gets I, extra attacks. That, that's on the one. The, then, the Chimera's really good. The Cockatrice is really good. Jabber's Light is shit still. But the other two monsters are really good. His fiery breath just auto mortal wounds. Yeah, just don't even roll. Just does mortal wounds. Before it was like one D3 or D6. Now it's just D3 all the time, I think. Yeah, his his savagery, his um monstrous rampage is add one attacks characteristics of melee weapons, but all the attacks must, must be the same, the same. Yeah. But that's a that means that's he gets okay. seven with the mauling claws, four with the lion head, four with the dragon head, four with the bird head. Yeah. That's what, twenty one attacks? <laughs> yeah. He's a buck eighty five. Uh, uh, Nineteen attacks. And he flies. <laughs> yeah. I really like the chimera. Not bad. I'm, uh, I'm, how bad did we want a new Jabber Slave yeah, model? That would be it. great. It's not good. I mean he still has the aesthetic blood thing as you hurt right. him and he hurts you back. Meh. Xenomorph style. Go to, go to the other two. The other yeah. two monsters are better. The other three monsters are better. Well, I think you The can... other five monsters are better. <laughs> Ten. I think... <laughs> and I think you can stack some shenanigans there. If you've got that Beast Lord within three of an mm-hmm. enemy hero, you've got the Gargan nearby. Like, you can all of a sudden have this aura of, of dudes getting extra attacks, getting easier mm-hmm. to hit. Like, yeah. Well, and then same thing with the Chimera. Mm-hmm. Extra attacks. Yep. Like charge extra attacks, monster pays extra attacks. Like it's just yeah, it's very killy. They escalate like quickly. I like it. Yeah, pretty pretty good. Uh, and I saw that um, the beast lord himself is pretty fighty now. He's all right. He's got five swings that do that too. Yeah, yeah. And bad. then he does I think mortal wounds when he six rolls six to hit. hit. Yeah. Now good. for people who aren't that familiar with Age of Sigmar, uh, when something says mortal wounds in addition, that's self explanatory. But when it says the attack sequence ends. Mm-hmm. I, I've seen people get weirded out by it because they think, does that mean oh, after the one mortal wound, it's over? Yeah. It's like, no, what it means is you don't have to roll a wound or roll a save. Right. That just part of it Damage goes through. Yeah. Uh, and then in each attack is resolved separately. Correct. So you don't resolve, the attack sequence ends for that individual Correct. die roll. Yep. So you could have the attack sequence end on all five of your attacks that all result in doing for him, two mortal wounds per yeah, swing. And, and so if he's yeah. got his things going and he's got six swings and yeah. you roll two sixes, well, those two, the damage just is yeah. through. Skip that. Four damage already. Roll the other four. Yeah. <laughs> roll the other four. Yep. Yeah, super good. Uh, but there are all, I'm sure there'll be other ways to give him plus one damage from other sources. Because they worded it specifically, whatever the damage of your weapon is, it does that many mortal wounds. I bet there's a relic or yeah, something. Because, yeah. because there are other examples where it's like, my weapon or is two damage. If I roll six to hit, it does two mortal wounds. But what if I get plus one damage my weapon? You're three damage if you rolled a wound. But if you roll that six to hit, it's only two mortals. It doesn't apply. That plus yep. one damage doesn't apply to the trigger of the of the automatic. But mortal when it wound. says the damage of your weapon, right? Yeah. Uh, they started that with the um, the swamp orcs. Mm-hmm. Is all of their guys are that wording already? Is they they did that? But then they switched it back, and there was a unit that in I think. Um, might have been the Slaves of Darkness book that they swapped the wording back to just oh, a flat lame. number of mortal wounds. But now they're back to your damage characteristic equals mortal wounds dealt. So who knows? Yeah, Again, whatever. another consistency thing where this isn't a balance thing. This right. is just like consistency in the way you word things. Because yep. if it's one mortal wound in addition, then it's like fine. Yep. Then it, it makes sense to be And then I don't care what, what, what damage my weapon is. Right. I'm doing one in addition. It's fine. So yeah, it's... um. A little bit of consistency could be could be warranted there. Yeah, and it and it makes me wonder if it was just like in different stages of their writing and testing process. Sure. Just one okay. got updated, one didn't. Yeah, um, and now they're stuck. Uh, speaking of AOS, though, uh, we have um, a small tournament coming up this weekend. Yep. So we, we're we're doing uh, we're hosting it, but it's run by um, a gentleman, a local gentleman at uh, Two Plus Tough, I believe, is running a tournament at the store. Uh, it's a thousand points. It's gonna be small. A lot of people seem interested though, so I think it's gonna be bigger than than we think. Well, and and you know, um, because while lots of people have Age of Sigmar around here, the models anyway, uh, it hasn't been featured in the store. Mm-hmm. It's not one that we get a lot of people on the tables for. So I think starting with a thousand points feels almost like doing a progressive campaign kind of thing. 
So you, you get people on the table with a small amount. They'll get a feel for the rules. Yep. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of rules questions. <laughs> it's a tournament, though, so it's yeah. not like come play test. Like, right? These should be people that have played the game before. Hopefully, you know that's that's Hopefully. the idea. Um, but there's some people we know who've played it, but haven't really played in three. And they just don't remember the rules at all, yeah. so they're relearning it. <laughs> yeah, I um, I've actually been been going on like forums like on Reddit, and you know, if people are showing off their paint jobs and stuff, it's just like scroll, scroll, scroll. I don't care. But it's. I stop and I answer a lot of rules questions, and it's it's kind of funny because uh, just read the rule book. That's ultimately the answer. Mm-hmm. Is just go read the rules. It's very clear. Yeah, you know. And so, like, I don't like when people answer a question. Other people answer a question. They say yes or no. So someone answers ask questions like, does this work like this? And they're like, yep. Period. And not helpful. Give me give me uh, some some reasoning behind it. Explain your answer basically. I learned that in school. Yeah. <laughs> so answer this question. Now explain it, you know? And so when I go and answer, I always go like, here's, here's the passage in the core rules, the yep. subsection, the sub subsection that talk about here's it. The FAQ. Here's, here's the, here's the three things that, that work into it. Here's the FAQ of a relevant, you know, mm-hmm. thing involved. Uh, here's what it says. And then here's my interpretation of it. Like I, <laughs> I write fucking essays in those in those posts uh, to explain because it's like I want to be very clear, not just here's my interpretation of it. It's like here are the past. I am citing my work of what I'm basing my ruling on. If I were a judge, here are the criteria that define it. Yep, that kind of thing. It was actually really funny the other day because I was talking to, uh, to a guy answering a question, and I cited a passage, and someone else in the same thread answered and was like the opposite answer. Because and then they quoted uh, very badly a, a section earlier in the in the book in the core rules that talked about it, and I was like, okay, well that's section seven says this is what you can do, but section twenty eight, whatever it was twenty five point three point one, whatever mm-hmm. uh, says in this phase you get to do this, you know. So here's what you know you can do. Answer the question. There shouldn't be any conflict of uh, uh, order of operations or anything because it happens at different. This thing Correct. Ha- this thing happens at the beginning. The thing you're talking about happens at the end. There's no conflict. You guys might be remembering a previous edition because it was had to do with endless spells. Um, a previous edition where it all happened at the beginning of the battle round, but endless spells move around. It doesn't do that anymore. It happens at the end, at the beginning. Your thing happens at the end. Whatever. No conflict. And this motherfucker <laughs> had the audacity to like respond to me, and I was like, yeah, okay, but. Here's what the thing says. And I like yep. quoted the thing and I wrote it out. It's like, this is what it says you can do. Because the question was whether you can try, which you can, you can mm-hmm. <laughs> attempt to, to unbind or um, dispel endless spells in your opponent's hero phase. Your wizards can attempt to un- to dispel existing endless spells in your opponent's hero phase. And the guy was like, nah, uh, uh. It's in your own hero phase. See, section seven says this. I'm like, yeah, motherfucker. But look, section 25 says each player takes turn every hero phase dispelling. Yep. And if you and if you do attempt to unbind an endless spell, you can't do it with another wizard. And that wizard can try to dispel or uh, unbind one fewer spells. It's like, it's very clear. You're doing this instead of unbinding. Yep. You only unbind in your opponent's hero phase. Yeah. And he's like, well, this says this. I'm like, motherfucker. So I go to like, <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't type this, but I was like, God damn it. You're testing me. So I went to the, I went to the FAQ yep. and I found the relevant thing. And it says about this exact thing we're talking about. Well, in section seven, it says this. In section 25, it says this, which takes precedent. It's like answer 25 takes precedent over section seven. And so I just like took that mm-hmm. and pasted that thing. And I'm like, bam. And what does he do? Deletes the comment, deletes his account. <laughs> Of course. He deleted his account. <laughs> but before he could do it, I was going to respond to his response to him when he posted. Because he was posting this exact thing to like every single person in this thread. Yeah. He was like pasting this, pasting it, this yeah. same exact thing. And he eventually responded to me with that. Mm-hmm. And I pasted this back and it says, it can't post this. That comment's been deleted. So I found a different comment of his in <laughs> that thread. And I was like, because you, get I was one. like, <laughs> because you deleted your comment on my comment, here's my response to you. The next day, deleted comment, deleted account. <laughs> he, he fucking he deleted his shit. He deleted his whole account because he was wrong. And you know that's so that's, funny. That's, that's a funny thing. Like yeah. in in the faceless uh, swamp 
of the internet. <laughs> yeah. That people can't handle being wrong. Yeah. So much that they would rather just erase the fact they ever had that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but it was funny because it was like four layers deep. And every time he, like someone responded and asked a question, I post another response clarifying it. And yeah. I was like, and I could find stuff about everything. And I was like, I was responding with why am I right? It was, it was a bit of a debate. I never, I never, I was never in debate. I feel like I could have done debate, but it was this kind of thing. It's like, here's my work. Here's, here's the you rest know, of things. You know, and while we talked earlier about mm-hmm. GW's, uh, efforts at wording things properly. There are a lot of times when I've seen those discussions happen where when you really just read it, Mm -hmm. it it would clear it up. But then when you point that out to them, rather than say, oh, that does answer my question, you'll see where their intentions really lie, which is they want to say this is worded poorly so they can complain about it. And so even when that's pointed to them, like I remember when we went to 8th edition 40K and for the first time GW started doing the more than Mm -hmm. for the inches. Yeah. And... It was very clear what that meant. It was like, you roll a nine, you ain't getting there. Right. It's got to be anything more than that. So you have to put them outside. And I watched people debate forever saying, well, GW sometimes done the at or more. So mm-hmm. until they say, it's like, no, it says more. It says more. It doesn't say at or more. And in no instance in this rule book does it say anything other yeah. than more. That's another one that it was the same kind of deal where it was, um, especially, specifically in Age of Sigmar. Their rule book is so good. It is. It is. It is. Everything it is, they do it is, is so clear yeah. in that. And I love it. Passage numbers are uh, amazing. So I want to say what page because it's if you're looking at a different publication, it could be a yep. different page. Section numbers, amazing. Anyway, uh, but another one was talking about uh, the Vermin Tide Endless Spell for Skaven. It's it's a like a tide that moves across the battlefield in one direction. Pile of rats doesn't affect Skaven models, uh, but after it moves, it does mortal wounds to a target. And if you move, retreat, charge, run, and you end those actions within three inches of it. You take the, the mortal wounds again. It's twelve dice every six is a mortal wound. So it's like it's not great because you do a couple mortal wounds. That's, that adds up. Though. But it's a deterrent, mm-hmm. and you can't end on it anyway. So the question was, well, if I do this and my opponent, a unit decides to to like to remain stationary, does it still trigger? Because the movement phase is over, does it count as you moving zero? Right? Because there are certain right. versions of forty k or other things where it's like. You can choose to, to move, but you just move zero or you move 0. 0.001. Right. Or whatever, instead of whatever your maximum distance is. So, like, does it count as that? So, I, you know, if they stay still, they just take the moral wounds. I'm like, nah, uh, uh. This is my catchphrase now. Mm-hmm. No. Nah. It's kind of like uh, uh, Newman. Dennis Nedry. From, from Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Ah, ah, ah. You didn't say that. Uh, Please, <laughs> Please, damn it. Hold on to your butts. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Original Jurassic Park, crazy game. What a, what a good movie. So much um, But anyway, but so it's like that's what he was arguing. It was like, well, it counts as moving zero, but you still move. And I'm like, no, you don't, because they define. If you go to movement phase, it defines in the movement phase you can perform the following actions: normal move, retreat, run. Is there another one? That's it. And instead of like in a later passage, it says when you select a unit in the movement phase, you can opt to instead of. A normal move, a retreat, or a run, you may opt to remain stationary. So I'm like, remaining stationary is not a normal move, a run, right. or a retreat. And those are the ones it's, that trigger the endless those spell. Those three right? things trigger the endless spell if you have within three of them doing those three things. But remaining stationary does not trigger. If they wanted you to take mortal wounds, no matter what you did, if you ended within three, they would have said, at the end of the movement phase, if you were within three right. inches yep. of this spell, <laughs> yep. you take these mortal wounds. But it's like, no, it Specified. says these actions. So yep. I'm like, because these actions are different from this action, it's not the same thing. What's the what's the football thing? Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Offsides. Whatever. <laughs> Stalling on the ball. Whatever. Delay of game. Delay of game. Yep. That's the one. <laughs> what when, I when you went past the play clock. Yeah, yeah, stepping on the ball. Delay yeah. of game. That's the thing. It's just like, no. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, it's a lot of those. I, I, I really like those kinds of questions, and I and I will always stop to answer those ones when I have time because well, and you know that that what you just talked about the fact that they have the passage numbers yes, and it tells you both permissive and what you can't do yeah um that's that's a really good way of writing it yeah and and I just don't see enough of that I think in their other I mean maybe it's different teams mm-hmm. um because because forty k has always been a bit of a monster where it is a more complicated game. So shouldn't they write the rules more like that with specific mm-hmm. passages? Which and I, I and they, say, do, they do in some, like they do the bullet point yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. But I, the passage numbers and um, and then like we saw with their updates, 
where they do the here's what it was before, here's what it is now. Age of Sigmar it's does just, do that. Forty K does. I do wish they would do it with their FAQs though, uh, because when they re- release a new FAQ, it's hard to remember what was there before. Yep. Because they also get rid of the previous version. Yep. So either they need versioning on their FAQs so you can compare to the previous, or um, or have a patch notes of what was changed, what was added, what was removed. Like I wish they would do that more thoroughly. Yeah. Uh, because like I, because when they just when they just color part of it blue, yeah, or whatever, it's like, well, what did this change? Well, like yesterday, two one, yeah, uh, yesterday they, re- they released the the document again for this current season. It says updated two one for Galician champions, whatever that season is mm-hmm. thing is called that that FAQ packet or designers commentary, whatever. And I'm looking through it. I'm like, I don't see anything different. There's only one passage that's pink. But that pink passage was pink last time. So it's like, I don't think you guys updated this. I think you just re-released, the, they, you re-uploaded the document and it gave you a new release date. It's like, I can't see a single thing that changed. It's like, yeah, yeah I, I was looking, but I don't have, I could probably find it. I downloaded it somewhere. But I didn't have the other, the old one handy to see what actually changed. So it's like, mm. uh, yeah, so a little bit more transparency of what yeah. is actually being updated would be nice. So maybe they'll, they'll do that at some point. Because they're making the changes, why not just note what the changes are? Yeah. You guys know what the changes are, right? Just put it in a bullet point at the end. It's like added this to this army, added this to this army, removed this from this section. Like you could do that easily. Is today Grounds- Groundhog's Day? Yeah, technically. So maybe that's why they did it again. Just relive in the same yeah, day. Which is funny because <laughs> nothing about that movie required it to be Groundhog's Day. Nope. It's not like this happened because it's Groundhog's Day. It's like that was just a thing that happened. That was one of the anchors of his, like him realizing that he was reliving the same days. Because when he woke up the next day, it's like, "Hey, it's Groundhog's Day." Yep. On the but radio, that made it that made it uh, stick, right? Exactly. So, because if it just would have been like, "Hey, it's Tuesday, August 13th, like <laughs> nobody cares, right? Exactly. Yeah. But it's like being Groundhog. Someone Day, somewhere I, I, heard it, that, by yeah. the way, and that's their birthday. It, it, I didn't mean yeah. your day. It, doesn't it matter. wasn't integral to the story that it was Groundhog's Day. No. But then they named the movie that. Yep. And so now it's like, ah, Groundhog's Day. And now it's when like, people make a reference, that's what they say. Yeah. Day. Something about Groundhog's Day repeats. It's like, yep. no, nothing is intrinsic about Groundhog's Day <laughs> that, it, that it's a re- repetitious yep. day. It's right. just that movie happens In to fact, be set on that day. When when Edge of Tomorrow, or now titled Live, Die, Repeat, yeah. came out, that's yeah. what people said. It's like, oh, it's just a sci-fi dark version of Groundhog's Day. It's like, and it's like I know you're talking about that movie. Yep. However... <laughs> Although it would be really funny if Live, Die, Repeat did take place within a single day and he kept dying and reliving it. Mm-hmm. And it was whatever the date was that in, in the movie, which then coincided with Groundhog's Day. Yeah. That would have been funny. <laughs> Low key. That would have been funny. funny. When you realize what day it is in that movie. February 2nd. Yeah. It was Groundhog's Day. It's like, that would be hilarious. Oh, man, I would have done that. I absolutely would have done that. Well, they that. got a chance. The sequel's in the works. Oh, right? my God. They don't need a sequel. They always need a sequel. They don't need repeat, a sequel. Repeat. The um, I, I liked that movie. Oh, it was good. Yeah. Uh, some might say it's almost as good as Groundhog's Day. Uh, almost. I did not like the end, though. Like so many movies, which we've complained about before, uh, I feel like they don't know how to end their movie. Yeah. They opened the right cans and, right? and got you to the Cause, cool spot. Because like, it was a bizarre ending with the weird water and the alien. T- like The Omega, yeah. The Omega was basically like... It looked like a blue onion. Was, was it chromosomes or something? Like right. it was weird, and it was just like it wasn't a satisfying ending either, because like everything ended happy. So it was, you know, it was like, weird as he woke up back on a chopper. Yeah, the the first chopper that you see before it, he but lands it was right. The morning after, there was an energy surge, and the aliens all died. Right, that's what it was. Or left. Yeah, that's right. And and then he goes and finds her. She doesn't remember him. He does his Tom Cruise smile in the yeah. credits roll. Yeah. Um. So he should have just died. Right. Your goal of reliving your life this day over and over and over again was to achieve your sacrificial death, defeating the aliens. To kill that thing, yep. You're dead. No one remembers you. No one knows you did it. Nope. They just wake up and the aliens are gone. Yeah. Yep. But you're dead. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> That's the mission. It should have been grim. It should have been, like, unsatisfying, but still kind of satisfying. You know, like, yep. I'm, I don't know why, but I get... Was there ever like a director's cut with alternate endings? I don't know. I hope so. Wasn't it based on a book or graphic sure. novel series? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Everything is. Mm-hmm. But it's like I've got this 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 kind of not infatuation, but like sort of a connection with self-sacrifice. 
I, and I've noticed that recently. Whenever self-sacrifice happens, like, I get choked up. Do I want to self-sacrifice saving somebody? <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. But it's There's like... There's probably a name for that. That's, it's kind of like a thing that I, that I have right now. Is whenever that... It, like, that's how it should end. It's like, you should be dead. You should die for for a good reason. You know? Um, I got, like, choked up the other day with something that, that kind of happened. And it was like, oh, well, that's weird. You know? It was, it was something mundane. It was something stupid. But it was, I don't know. I don't remember what it is now. But that should have happened there. That would have been powerful. Yeah. I feel like that's a powerful thing when you realize, when you make the conscious decision to be like, well, I'm going to die. Yeah. But I'm going to save everyone. Well, and then, you know. And, and it needs to be good because there are a ton of movies where the care and they made fun of it on that cartoon regular show, mm -hmm. where there are other characters who do the self-sacrifice when it's totally not necessary right. and they easily could have gotten out. Well, <laughs> that's. On the contrast, mm -hmm. there's a. I mean, I, I guess kind of similar to this, where he like he didn't die and everything lives happily ever after. Uh, I was watching. Um, I've run out of things to watch. <laughs> I've been watching some anime, and I was watching One Piece. Man, that heart that show was so hard. I, we don't talk about anime very often, nope. but <laughs> I'm going to talk about it here though. Uh, spoilers for this years and years and years old show. I'm only like 150 episodes in. Only. only. Of the thousand yep. or whatever. But uh, in whatever story arc I was watching where they're going to this desert island, there were like three, I think three characters that sacrificed themselves to help the princess of the kingdom uh, get home to stop a rebellion that was stoked by a warmonger who was playing off of both sides and was going to kill everyone and usurp the throne. That was it. It was basically, okay. <laughs> it was, it was basically the story, right? Uh, he he's supplying the rebellion with with ideas and money and uh, uh, supplies. He's you know kind of a manipulating the strings with the kingdom because he's got a guy who can shapeshift and give orders as the king. Whatever. So they're gonna they're all gonna fight. And he's gonna kill everybody and take over. Well, it so happens that all the characters who sacrifice themselves along the way for her to get there and stop it are all actually alive still, mm. and they show up later, still alive. And it's like. God damn it, why? The guy had a good kind of story arc where you were infiltrating, him and the guy, you know, him and the princess were like infiltrating the organization. And like as a decoy, he went off. The ship blows up because they thought she was on it, the queen, the princess was on it. So he, he knew the ship was going to be destroyed. But then he just like shows up later, just fine. It's like, how? Another one, they have like a nuclear bomb in the middle of the city. And the guy like Dark Knight's it where he grabs it and flies it off into the sky. And it explodes. A bomb that was going to kill a million people. He's holding it. And it blows up right next to him. Survive. So they assume he's dead. It's like, oh, what a, what a great hero. He sacrificed himself to save everyone's lives. And then at the end of the arc, it shows up and he's just like, he's just wounded in a, in a cabin. And a, like an old man is taking care of him and nursing him <laughs> back to health. It's like, why? Why, you, why can't you just let those characters be dead? Yep. Their sacrifice was meaningful. You undercut them, it doesn't mean shit now. Yeah. Tom Cruise. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and obviously there are all sorts of fan theories that spun off it, yeah. like him killing the Omega was just another stage of the alien's control and blah, 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 so it's right. resetting another type. Right. Um, I know they were planning to start filming the sequel mm -hmm. pre-COVID. That all got put on hold. Now I think they're supposed to start. But, you know, he's he's been pretty good about not attaching himself recently to, to too many terrible projects, yeah. so we'll see. But... Uh, no, I, I like that franchise. But it's just so many examples of movies that they just ended badly. Yep. Um, yep. Another Tom Cruise movie is that the Mission Impossible one with um, Superman. Uh, yep. It just ended poorly. It was 15 minutes too long. Yep. Just end sooner. You whole, know? A whole act of nonsense. The, the whole that weird, the previous. The weird, the weird, like, like slow fall of that helicopter down that cliff and the fight. It's like, didn't yeah, the, need any the, of it. The Plinko helicopter? Yeah. yeah. It's just like, no, just make the helicopter crash and the bad guy died. That was you winning. Is you <laughs> helicopter fight. You shoot down his helicopter, he crashes and dies. Done. You did it. Well done. You win. You don't need to go down there to the wreckage and then fight him hand to hand so you can kick him off the cliff. You don't need to do that. He's, you win. Fly away. Like, leave. Yep. Uh, yeah. I actually had a D&D &D campaign where one of my characters ended by self-sacrifice. I teleported myself with a bomb, basically, to a different plane of existence. And like... Iron Man. But you yeah, didn't come back. I mean, essentially, yeah. it's what I did because yeah. it was really funny. We had this like shard of a elemental plane of water and it was like creating an artificial winter that was so cold that it was going to like permeate for hundreds of miles and kill everything. And so we had this really funny, 
Oh my god, this really funny plan. It was a it was a Pathfinder rule set, so just so you're aware. And we and this might not be interesting, but we're at, we're rolling up to the end here. So <laughs> if you listen this far, good on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the plan was to send it to be destroyed because it had like a guardian and it was going to regenerate and uh, constantly have to fight the guardian of the shard, whatever. Uh, boss fight the shardian yeah and so the idea was to send it to a different to, to plane or shift it and send it to a different plane so it's like oh well we can either send it back to we had three ideas send it back to the plane of water where it's from okay that's that's a that's an idea but then you know whatever who, who knows what's gonna happen with it there two send it to the plane of fire it'll melt be destroyed by the fire that's there cool uh number three teleport it somewhere else on the material plane and then not worry about it. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> send send it problem. somewhere else and let someone else deal with it. Yep, that was it. And so we're like, those are the three options. It's like, well, let's maybe send it to the to the realm of water just to send it home because we don't know if like it needs to be back where it is to stop doing its thing or if it needs to be destroyed. Whatever. Let's let's send it to the to the, the realm of water and just get rid of it. It's fine. Well, our plans were well, we don't want to touch this thing because it's so cold. It would probably hurt us. Mm-hmm. So what can we do? Well, we can give it to a companion. So we like went and grabbed our pack mule. <laughs> We're gonna stick it in like the donkey's backpack, and then send the donkey to the other plane with yep. the thing. Well, as it turned out, the donkey died when he touched it. Instantly, <laughs> instantly died. So we're like, okay, better idea. Undead creatures are immune to cold. Raise the donkey. <laughs> so we raised an undead skeletal zo- uh, donkey. And then we're going to give the Shard of Ice to the donkey. It's like, cool. The donkey can now hold it. It's in his pack. He's holding it. Let's send him to the other plane. We're not on a high enough level to do a plane shift uh, thing. Because we're not, you know, we just haven't gotten there. So we have scrolls that have a chance of failing. Yep. Well, as it turns out, in that rule set, if you're sending a willing creature, even if it's like willing, but you're not going with you, they have a chance to resist. Well, it's my donkey. I've raised it. So it's only going to succeed on like a 20. No big deal. Pretty good chance. So I get the roll. I succeeded at casting the spell. Cast the donkey. There goes a donkey. Someone rolls the, the dice for us. 20. Resisted the, the send. It's like, God damn it. The the 1 in 20 thing actually happened. It resisted he being sent. A, a a stereotypically difficult donkey. <sighs> yep. So it's like, God, it's stubborn as a mule. Yep. God damn it. So we're like, all right, well... We only have one of this really expensive scroll left. If that happens again, because I had a pretty low chance of actually casting the scroll because it's a higher level spell. If we fail it, something terrible could happen. If we succeed, the donkey could could resist again. And if that happens, we are screwed. So it's like, well, if the donkey's holding it and I go with the donkey, there's no check. There's no save required because... It's a willing creature being taken along with me. Yep. I'm like, but I can't survive in the, in the realm of fire and I can't survive in the realm of water. So where do I go? Some other. I'm going to go to like, there's there's one realm. It's called Elysium. And it's mm-hmm. just the neutral, like the, the neutral zone. Yep. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't tell any of the party this. This is all me. Like we went to a different channel and we were, because we, were, we have an online campaign. We, I was talking to the GM about it. I was like, well, what? here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give like a cool guy thumbs up and wink at the party mm-hmm. and say something cool like, you know, I'll see you when I see you. Yep. Basically give the Terminator thumbs up, grab the donkey, vanish with the donkey. And I'm going to take him to Elysium. I'm going to go ask the, ask the, 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 uh, the uh, what are they called? Archons, the archons. Or, yep. or whatever that live there for help. Because my character was neutral, lawful neutral. The most boring <laughs> alignment because you have like almost no choice yep. what's the law say that's what i'm doing yep. and they're all all for neutral there so i was going to go there my character would go there and ask for help uh getting home was the was the idea but no one knew my plan i didn't discuss the plan with anybody i was just like snap decision made blink blink and so they th- and the original plan was no the, the original plan was to destroy the shard because we didn't know if the guardian was going to come back so we we're going to destroy it they thought i self-sacrificed to go teleport myself and the shard to the realm of fire to kill myself. So they're all like, they were all kind of depressed. And like when I was describing what I was going to do, I kind of got a little choked up. Not because I was super attached with the character, but the idea of, of like, you know, mm-hmm. worthy goal, you know, worthy cause sacrificing yourself. Like, I don't know. It just gets to me. Yeah. You know? And so it was like, it was kind of a, you know, a touching choked up kind of moment of, of me like 
kind of retirement like my my character could come back essentially you know later uh you know i i rest up and prepare a new spell and just teleport back or go there and kill some stuff and level up and learn the spell and then teleport back in in, in the sequel you yeah. you you spent all this time on the plane yeah you then become rough and tumble because you're surviving on the neutral plane. <laughs> There's a city there right. that I can just go to that's just like any other, you know, whatever. And the next generation of people in the story find you there and your generation's older. I'm but, higher level. Yep. Yeah. I was a weird character too. Because Pathfinder has, has so many like archetypes. I was a, I was a wizard, but I was specialized in some way to be like a healer. I was a wizard with, with healing spells on my spell list. Because we didn't have, our party didn't have a wizard or a healer. So I was like, I'll do this. <laughs> I'll be a bit of both. And then all I did was cast Fireball all day. <laughs> so I didn't even need to heal very much. Yeah, it was so funny. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Anyway, that's my story. Go kill yourself for a, for for a reasonable good cause. cause. I guess that's my the moral of the story. You know, and, and, and circling back to oh. miniatures, uh, Sigismund thought mm-hmm. he was killing himself for a good cause because he thought he was going to get Abaddon. Mm-hmm. And he didn't. Whoops. Abaddon was just like, I'm just going to go back in the warp. and So Abaddon is also a warp being? No. So how does he work? So he, the the war master of chaos is like, a, it's weird. They're, they're described as being like this hollow conduit. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's different. Like Horus completely tried to sell his soul to the warp to be this conduit of the four powers. Because that's how Angron even described seeing him. Mm. He could like Neo, Matrix, True Sight, other, and, he de- and Horus definitely wasn't a, demon or like he was just a shell is how he looked at it hmm. abaddon though has always been kind of resistant to it it's like he uses enough of it that he needs to but he's also like it's weird because sigismund squarely got him sort of lance allotted himself allowed mm-hmm. himself to be killed to get then, close to yeah. him and then, but then abaddon just like survived so i i don't know i don't know what he is if he can heal or what interesting yeah so he didn't get it it was like no. After and it was way after <laughs> so the, sad. The, the the civil war, the heresy ended. Mm-hmm. So Sigismund finally gets his battle with someone worthy. Mm-hmm. Thinks we're going down to the same time. Abaddon, thousands of years later, is like I'm still here. I'm still good. Yeah. Yeah. Then we talk about um, our predictions for um, the rest of Arcs of Omen. I don't know because each because each book has is themed around a character. Yeah. And we still know the fourth book is question mark. Mm-hmm. But with I mean obviously Abaddon's book of book one. We've Angren's got book two. Angren book two, which which should be the world leaders, which they are on pre order now, mm-hmm. so they're coming. Yep, soon, yeah. maybe next weekend. Not this coming, but the one after. So that's exciting. That's coming. But but I hear there's no there's actually no rules in the Arcs of Omen book. Okay, for like match play, which is fine. It's all the boarding action game. Okay, this one. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So then, so so like Angron's rules aren't in that book. Okay. They're in the world. They're gonna be the world. Book. Okay, yeah. that's fine. I'm fine yeah. with that. Third book we know is Vashtor, yep. which is a very interesting character. The more they talk about him, the more interesting he becomes. He is, yeah. Because he's almost like genie wish fulfillment, trick you with contracts, sort of. I'll give you exactly what you asked for, but with a twist. Right. Kind of deal broker, which is very interesting. And, and he's 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 a demigod in yeah. that he's an entity who's like control of all things machina in the war. Mm-hmm. And so the other, the four chaos gods will use his services to right. make because he's their armor yeah. basically and so all of them are actually afraid to piss him off mm-hmm. because then he'll start favoring one over the other right uh or or whatever bellicor even bellicor hates him mm-hmm. but um it, it's kind of the same thing it's like but then that's also interesting because bellicor isn't a chaos god he's a being similar to vashtor correct. as like a rival yep as a like i'm aspiring to become my own thing so, but, but they just describe him like not wanting to strike deals with him. So like Bellacor deals with, with like pure demon. Yep. Because he doesn't want the mechanized. Correct. And because they would have to deal with Vashtor. Yep. But then they you were talking about in the story that Vashtor has got plans. Part of it relies on him going to an Imperial like home world of one of the space Marine chapters. And I think it's Dark Angels. Dark Angels. Yeah. So it's not the rock. No. But it was, it was, it was one of their planets. Yeah. That there's something on the planet that he's going and looking for. And it's like, we don't know Correct. what that is yet. And and, at the, and he was, he actually described him being worried because mm. the uh, the fourth crusade, the fourth crusader fleet of the Indominus Crusader or whatever showed up. Mm. And so like huge Imperial defenses are there. And so Vastor is like, I don't like these odds, calculate. Mm-hmm. And Abaddon was like, oh, don't worry, Angron's there. 
<laughs> Which is so funny. Angron's already there. Yeah. Like, and, and so, and then they, of course, that beautiful artwork they have of Angron that, that yeah. I just love of him yeah. coming through the yeah. Imperial fire. And you just see this giant emerging and they pour Imperial guards and are like, oh. <laughs> like, so what do you think is, 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 is what they're looking for? What do you think it is? I don't think, um, well, as an aside, I don't think what Angron's there for has anything to do with either of those two. Okay. Angron's just been given a direction to go hunt. Yeah. Right. That's what he does. Like a shark. He just, that's all he thinks about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but that's the same reason Horus, that's the same way Horus used him. Mm-hmm. It, it was like once Angron was in that state, you throw him at a problem and he goes and gets it's it. It's like one of those little car toys where you like pull him back and you wind him up yeah. and then just line it up and just let it go and it goes, yep. and it's like zips <laughs> off. That's Angron. He gets all wound up. You pull him yep. back like a slingshot almost. And he just like propels himself. They know they can't strike a deal with him. <laughs> they know they can't. Yeah. You just promise him there's stuff to kill and yeah. he'll, it'll ease his pain and he'll go do it. Abaddon and Vashtor are, are, Work in this deal. I don't know if they fully trust each other. Mm-hmm. You know, Abaddon rarely trusts warp entities, and and Vashtor's clearly got his own goals. Goals. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did like the way they describe his contracts as being like a D and D genie, where it's yeah. like, oh yeah, I'll give you exactly what you want. Well, there was that there was that episode of um, what we do in the shadows where they did the genie <laughs> too, and that one was very very good. Yeah, I liked that episode a lot. Oh, make sure I want to have the biggest penis in the world. And he's like. Uh, uh, but put put a clause in there that don't shrink everyone else's penis. And then Jeannie's like, ah, good idea. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love that. That episode is so good. Yeah, That's a great show. And then it ended up, it only had to grow this little bit. Yeah, he's he like, already, he already has. <laughs> yeah. But they made it so that he only thinks of Guillermo whenever he gets aroused. It was funny. Because he said that right so, at yeah, the end. Yeah, right at the end. And the genie, you can see the, the line that Jeannie's like, yep. okay. Is that what you want? Yes. You got it. I loved it. Um, but yeah, but because they, they also showed off that Vashtor is coming initially in a box set versus Blood in, or uh, Dark Angels. With the new Azrael. Because we know that that, uh, that box set involves some campaign yeah. at that Blood Angel world. That also makes me think that, like the like I said, that the lion might be right. The, maybe the reason they have book four is question mark is because could be. book four is the lion. It could be. And you, and you know... Um, it was describing they're looking for these items that yeah. are seemingly right. insignificant to most people who don't know what they're about. And they're being described as keys of some sort. Now, how Vashtor knows about them, I don't know. Right. Um, I don't think he made them or anything and they got scattered. But it could be a part of the fact that nearly every loyalist Primarch that disappeared sometime after the heresy always left mysteries around the galaxy for their legion to find. Right. And that's when they would come back. And and it could be that's what it is. It could it could even be Abaddon and or Vashtor thinks they can leverage the line against Gilliman. Yeah. Um, well, we also know that there's like there's weird shit that happens to the Dark Angels, right? Yeah. The Dark Angels yep. are are a mysterious bunch. Mm-hmm. They are some of the most like grim gothic of the Space Marines. And some of the they're they're drenched in like mysticism. Yep. And a lot of them, you know, immediately don't trust anyone else, including yeah. each other. There's like rituals that they do. They're yeah. like. They, if anyone like would be considered living in a monastery and having like those kind of monastic, yeah, those monastic like traditions, it's, it's dark angels. Yeah. They're, they're so adorned with like, yeah, with rituals that it's, it's a little weird, but then we know that there's like the watchers, which are, what the hell are they? They're some kind of demonic entity of some kind, harmless, but like they ain't humans. Well, and, you know, and they're, they're so little trust within even their own circles that for example, Asmodee, the interrogator chaplain, while he has rules and has been around the game for a while, he's actually not the grand master of interrogator chaplains. Mm-hmm. And it's because the inner circle viewed him as too zealous. Um, so they don't have, because the current grand master of it has specifically, has yeah. a much more like reserved tone, but it's so wise, cool dialogues between them. Yeah. But um, so there's all that going on. They, they don't, they, they don't trust each other. Yeah. yeah. You're right. What the hell are the watchers? They what? carry around little relics and they deliver and they're like, they're squires, but they're sort of like, yeah, you're little gremlins of some, like, what the hell are they? And for Asriel to be directly involved in right. this campaign usually means something because right. he's not just Grandmaster of the Dark Angels. He's of all successor chapters. Yeah. He's almost in charge of a legion, yeah, which, which is deal. rare. Uh, and then there's, um, you know, the, the but, weird but thing. I don't think Gilliman named him right a, a Praetor or whatever. He didn't name him. Well, there was, there was also the weird thing about... Um, a few years ago, they had that new Cypher model come out. Yep. And that Cypher model was not wielding, but carrying around broken sword. the Lion's Sword, mm-hmm. which we assume is a Lion's Sword, uh, which is a relic. Because it was large. Chapter. It was huge. It was yeah. too big for him to wield. Yep. 
so there's like that weird thing, that weirdness that's going on about Cypher and maybe Cypher being a title, not being a person. Right. And so like this latest Cypher maybe has a shard of the lion's sword. Might be. And so it's like, what the hell is it? And so a little bit of a mystery and a little bit of a, a, a pulling back the curtain of like years of, of um, setup could be yeah. coming soon with the revelation of, oh, by the way, here's the lion. Mm-hmm. Out of nowhere, kind of thing. I this campaign would, uh, you know, a campaign like this would be the way to do it too. I agree. You know, because it's it's already bringing Angron, which is exciting. Yeah. Let's also get a good guy too. Right. Be it, cool. it would certainly um, it would throw it off a little bit because it was like bad guy, bad guy, bad guy. Yeah. And so you'd think there'd be uh, some other one, but yeah, it'd be really funny because we also know that there's a new Farsight model coming. Oh, that's right. Is if they open up. They open up the vault. So Vastra gets there and they open up the vault in the heart of what I think it, it is. I think oh, it is Farsight. Whatever planet. Because that question mark says Ordo Xenos. Oh, that'd be interesting. So yeah. what, so some, I don't know. This is just all But what would Farsight have to do with the deeper, older. That's what I'm wondering. I don't know. Battles in the galaxy. I don't know. Tower, because because they're, so, so they're so far yeah. away from that too. Yeah. But that's why I think it'd be funny is if they show up, they, they open up the vault. They all, they're racing to the vault to find the lion because they think he's in there and there's some mystical thing in there and they open up the vault. It's just Commander Farsight. <laughs> it's like, what the, what is he doing? What is, why is he there? Because there's like, I mean, there is something to the fact that Farsight has that sword. The, yeah. The whatever Sunblade or whatever it's called. He's got that sword, which is clearly like relic level thing. Yeah. Tao didn't make Just it. Doesn't know what it is. You know, uh, some ideas that maybe it's it's a Catan sword or it's a something from the Necrons left behind. Something. It's because I don't think it's a demon blade, but I think right. it's it's a, it's anathema to demons. Yeah. So it's some kind of relic that you know he's they don't like. using to his advantage that he doesn't understand. But that would be really funny. <laughs> Just far sights there in the middle of there for no reason. That planet. But that, but that model is coming. We do still know that. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think it necessarily means because it says Ordo Xenos that it is that. It might just be the Ordo Xenos is the ones redacting, redacting the information yeah, or yeah. something. That could be. Whatever. Or maybe it was originally going to be, but now it's not. Who knows? So, th- so there's potential for for some stuff. I could see if they are uh, rounding third and ready to slide into home for tenth edition. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how we got Gilliman was at the end of seventh start of eighth. Yeah. I could see the lion being that. And, and I know there was because it was because it was a Mortarian and Gilliman and Magnus was early. He was first, yeah. But then Magnus and Mortarian came like pretty close to one another, mm-hmm. and then it was like around the beginning yeah, of a new and, edition. And there was a story where th- there was something happening. But they fought each other because I remember that the artwork where Gilliman's like sword up and then yeah. Mortarian's there, sending you know like obviously Gilliman came first, but like yeah. Angron's coming first this time. And, and, it could, and even though um, like Angron and the Lion don't really have history together, but doesn't mean they can't. Yeah. And um, but whatever Vashtor is doing is, Vashtor. is stoking something. Yeah. And and you know the lion. I think some people thought might be a boring one um, because he's not so extreme as somebody like say uh, Lehman Russ or or, right. or the Khan or these people who are off doing mysterious things somewhere. But like the lion's a really interesting character. Um, well, I, I and think he and Gilliman are in direct conflict about a lot of things. Exactly. I think that's why it's the most interesting. And even to though thousands him. of years have gone, yeah. does that change it? Do they decide to be on common ground? Does he see what Gilliman's doing? It's like, whoa, buddy. Yeah. Well, did Gilliman even was he even conscious for any of those thousands of years? Because he was in stasis, right? Gilliman, Cause, cause Gilliman was one of the last ones to go under. I think. Okay. Because um, he was like stabbed by something that was correct. poisoned. Yep. And then they had to put him in stasis so they could find a cure. They never found a cure. Instead, they just give him a new set of armor that, just, that, is, con- his blood, that is constantly <laughs> like, yeah, keeping the poison at bay. Well, and and so some speculate, by the way, that Call has a failsafe in it. Mm. If he ever thinks that'd be interesting, Gilliman opposes his agenda. Yeah, I mean, um, I, mean I can totally see that. Yep. It just turns off. Yeah, power fails. Yeah, dead. And, and Call is another weirdo. Yeah, um, there's a reason they won't make him the uh, uh, fabricator general. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's almost like they Vashtor is a is a counterpart, an evil counterpart to Call. Yeah. Where you've got Abaddon, Vashtor, Gilliman, Call. Yeah. Like yep. they're they're very you know. Yep. Uh, um, counter, but like reflective of one another. Agreed. That's it, interesting. Um, yeah. Like yeah, mirror images of each other. Um, but I but again, I wonder if if the lion because because Gilliman went under so late, maybe he. 
Well, Lion learned. was pretty late too, because yeah, he was betrayed. Right, you had the whole Luther thing. And, yeah. Um, but but both of them kind of went to sleep. I mean, if he has even been asleep right. this whole time, uh, with the ideals that they had when they were put under. He's just playing Xbox and his right. yeah. rock. But so like Gilliman went to sleep and woke up thousands of years later. He already had those ideas. Yeah. That he has now. You know, and so like yeah, he started the primaries project before he went under. Yeah, and and so I think that Lion would have gone under with still faith in the emperor's, you know, the codex and yep. what the emperor's thing. Whereas Gilman definitely didn't. Similar to how with the siege of Terra, he was waiting to see what happened to see if Terra yeah. fell yep. to see if he could create his own empire with Terra being gone, or if he needed to. You know yeah. what I mean? Exactly. And so like, I I think even then, which is the, why he didn't make it back in time. Oh, oh, it just happened not right. to make it back. And it's yeah. like, oh, wait, wait, we're going to win. Uh, now let's show up. Yeah. You know, to make it look like Cause, cause, we were going to come the whole time. Because even though there are reasons he he couldn't have because of maybe what was going on in Ultramar, it's like that was the thing the whole time that both sides were waiting for. Horace was like, I have to move faster because right. Gilman's fleet shows up. That's a problem. Well, the word bears were like, Horace is going to explode. He's got to do this quick. <laughs> and then and then Dorn kept like, is he coming? Right. Like, so... Then some wonder if, which they're going to explore in the next books, is if Gilliman told any of his brothers, including the line, about the Primaris Project mm. or not. If he did, what were their thoughts on it? If he didn't, what do they think when they right. wake up? Like, what would well, Lion think? Especially considering that? that Lion, if he wakes up and he's been out this whole time and wakes up and sees many members of his own inner circle, of his own chapter, well, of, Ezra, of, of the never, hype. He's never met. Yeah, or, or any of these people yeah. that are that are high-ranking Dark Angels have crossed. Have that. already crossed into Primaris. It's like, well, yeah. What's he going to think about that? Who are, who are these thousands of new Marines that are all like this? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So these, you, these aren't my sons. Yeah. You know, like these and, aren't. And so, it, how were they made? And so you'd have, uh, you, you'd create a situation where I mean, we already think of forty Ks. There are no good guys, right? Mm-hmm. But now you might have just a conflict on the Imperial Imperium side, right. which could be interesting. Yeah, an Imperial Civil War. Mm-hmm. When the lion comes back, which would be cool, <laughs> It'd be super cool. But it's not. Alpha but it's, like, it's not even yeah. like fighting over, you know, chaos. Hmm. It's it's fighting over like who's more right. Their ideology. Yeah. yeah. It's so which makes it I think even more interesting because it's not just good versus less good. Mm-hmm. Or no, it's not even evil, evil versus, versus le- evil, evil versus less evil. It's it's actually there's no one's right here because it's a different thing. It's a difference of opinions. Yeah. You know you're. Your thoughts are, are just diametrically opposed to what you think is the right path. Yeah. And it's right versus right. <laughs> and, tearing, yeah. Uh, and tearing the Imperium further asunder mm-hmm. instead of uniting when they need to. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of one of your secretly favorite legions, the Alpha Legion. Mm-hmm. They, they, it turns out they were, they were for the Imperium the whole time. Well, they explained in this newer fluff <laughs> that a part of what Abaddon's doing on one of these worlds he's going for and on the Arcs. He has planted Alpha Legion members that are loyal to him to act as agents to find if there are people looking to betray Abaddon once he gives them some sort of power, etc. Interesting. Yeah. So he's planted Alpha Legion ones that he knows or thinks he knows are loyal to him. <laughs> Which they aren't. Because they're never loyal <laughs> they to him. They never are. Yeah. I, I, I just think, like, it, I can't remember where we read it, but the description of the Alpha Legion that I love the best is it's like the Alpha Legion's only goal is the eradication of humanity because that's the only way to end to the end conflict. Yeah. all of it, yeah. right? It's just a is just total human extinction because then there are no chaos entities. There's no gateways into real space from yep. chaos. Yep. Chaos is permanently shut up because all of their gates, humans, are gone. Mm-hmm. That's the only that's the only way to do it. The pyramid needs to end because it'll end chaos as well. They're tied together. Yeah, and so like the Alpha Legion is working with chaos to. Destroy chaos. Yep. <laughs> it's just yep. like, yep. huh, that's interesting. Which, who knows if that's even possible now with, with yeah, real space being ripped, you know, the maledictum and everything. Mm-hmm. Like, who knows what their plans are anymore because maybe that's not the avenue that yeah. gets rid of chaos now. And there are probably things that they that they didn't foresee. And then Abaddon's a different animal. It's like, while he isn't as individually powerful as, say, a Primarch, he is actually like a way better war master than Horus was. Mm-hmm. Like, he cut, he checks all his boxes, whereas like Horace sat up in his room right. until he was ready to fight. Being Dad. being charismatic, yeah, until he was just ready to fight joshing Dad. with people and joking <laughs> and making everyone happy. Yep. You know, because he kind of did a bit of that. Yeah, and then he did nothing in the war until he had to fight Dad. Right, and and like, I just think it would have been useful if if he was down there actually on the walls fighting yeah. through. 
You yeah. are you are you are horse ascended. Yeah. Get down there and it, and then and then ascend those stairs. Yeah, <laughs> you are a monster. Um, but I mean, there's there's some tactical brilliance to that. Let everyone do do the work for you. But uh, but like Abaddon tries to really check his boxes. It's rare that anyone on the chaos side pulls one over on him. Well, that's why he's had thirteen consecutive successful crusades. Failed crusades. <laughs> successful crusades. Failed success. What's the word? Task failed successfully. Right. Yeah. Right, like mm-hmm. you know, I only pretended to lose because I achieved a different goal that you weren't expecting. That you weren't expecting me to. You expecting me. He did blow up the things. <laughs> he did destroy Cadia. Yeah. So I mean, mm-hmm. obviously he's doing something right. The words of of banishment on Cadia are gone. Yep. So now it's and easier. He's, and he's managed to. Uh, he's he managed to string up all these these ship flotillas, these these flotsam ships uh, that turn into fortresses. He's managed to remain their conduit for ten thousand years. Yeah. And, and it's the only one who, it's weird, the Chaos Gods will tell, like, other lords and other beings, he, they ordered Mortarian to follow Abaddon, mm. like a Primarch. That, that had to be insulting to a Primarch. Like, yeah. you want me to follow that guy? That guy? I remember this guy. I he remember was, that guy. Like, Horace's little fucking henchman. Yep. What, what do you mean, follow, follow him? <laughs> yep. Fine. Oh, Mortarian, you did. You didn't do well enough. Get in the garden for yeah. ten for a thousand years. Away. It's like Abaddon still gets to do what he wants. Yep. Mortarian just sit there pouting in the garden. <laughs> Little nerdlings are crawling over him, and he's like, "God damn it!" I'm gonna Stupid just Abaddon. Put, put in timeout. You know. I remember when you were Ezekiel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Yeah. I don't know if I would eat nerdlings, but uh, we could eat something that's yeah. gardenish. Yeah. Let's do it. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed. Check out our new episodes every Friday on Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Audible, or on Podbean. You can also follow myself and Llama on Instagram for more. We are at Hyena Paints Minis and at Llama Paints Minis. And as always, we'll catch you next time.